All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I got about 23 of us here, so we're going to get started. I uh, want to start with apologies for our technical difficulties, which we've been having uh, this afternoon, um, having some issues with uh, with Facebook Live, which we have been able to sort of get, uh, get figured out. So um, my name is Jake Wynn. I'm the Director of Inter Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine uh, and at the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum as well. Uh, I'm going to be leading kind of a Facebook Live discussion, uh, conversation, a uh, little presentation about Civil War field hospitals. Um, so we've been doing these Facebook Live uh, events and programs for about two weeks now, uh, ever since the start of the uh, COVID-19 situation. Um, we have been shut down uh, to the general General public. So these opportunities, these programs provide us with a chance to talk with all of you, um, to converse with you, um, no matter where you are in the United States or around the world, and to talk about the relevance of Civil War medicine. Uh, arguably, right now, we are experiencing kind of a rebirth of relevance of Civil War medicine just because of so many emergency measures being taken that do remind us quite a bit of some of the measures that were taken during the Civil War era. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is just talk a little bit, give a, a brief presentation about the evolution of Civil War field hospitals, uh, and then I'll open up for questions. So if you have a question throughout the program, just uh, drop a comment into the uh, into the comments on the side of the video, uh, and that will uh, let me see those questions. Uh, we'll get through some of those at the end. I'll try to to take a look at the uh, at the comments um, as they're coming in. Um, and try to answer any questions as, as we're going through, um, but we will have a, a de dedicated Q&A session at the end of this, uh, of the end of my presentation uh, that will dive into some of your questions. Uh, getting into how we are supporting these uh, these programs, um, well, members of the museum are helping to support us. So thank you if you are already a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. You help to sustain our operations and ensure that we are able to continue telling these stories of Civil War history uh, and applying those lessons, um, giving uh, those lessons to leaders so that they can apply them uh, today in our ever-changing uh, emergency situation. Um, if you want to support our efforts, if you enjoy these Facebook Live programs, if you want to support the, the uh, digital endeavors of the museum, highly recommend becoming a member of the museum. Um, this gives you um, the ability to help sustain our efforts and keep us going. We are a member-supported uh, organization uh, that that subsists basically entirely on admissions, which sadly we are not getting today because of uh, the COVID-19 situation. Uh, but members help to continue our operations and allow us to continue uh, to tell these important stories. So if you like our programs, I hope you'll consider becoming a member. You can find a link to where you can become a member in the comments on this video, uh, and that will allow you to support these efforts. Uh, you can also consider donating as well, and you'll find that on the support tab on the civilwarmed.org website. So without further ado, uh, let's dive into the story of Civil War field hospitals. So this is a story that in order to really truly understand the, the origins of Civil War field hospitals, we need to go back a bit. Um, we need to go back to, to earlier conflicts in American history and also conflicts elsewhere uh, in the world that are going to help to shape the, the origins of Civil War field hospitals. We go back to the American Revolution. Field hospitals are an ever-present site on those battlefields um, back in the in the 18th century. Um, those field hospitals, oftentimes close to the fighting weaponry of that day, uh, not as uh, longer range as what you'll see during the American Civil War. And so that means that those hospitals can be fairly close to the front lines. Uh, and that means those hospitals are going to be located in in barns, uh, houses, structures close to the battlefield that are going to provide some uh, some. Structure. That is going to be a parallel that you're going to see during the Civil War. That same idea about field hospitals being close to the battlefield, oftentimes inside structures, is going to be the case during the uh, War of 1812, as well again during the uh, Mexican-American War in the 1840s. Uh, but by the time we get to the Civil War, those ideas haven't really changed all that much um, about where you're going to place uh, a field hospital. Now there are events in Europe that are going to uh, see a change in the uh, in how hospitals are going to be managed during an emergency situation. Uh, one of the big uh, wars leading up to the American Civil War uh, is the Crimean War. Uh, in in the Crimea, uh, part of um, was then the Russian Empire, um, conflicting between uh, Russians, the Turks, 
uh, British and French forces all duking it out on the Crimean Peninsula. And that is going to be very instructive um, in the mid 1850s uh, for healthcare, emergency healthcare in a battlefield situation uh, for decades um, after that conflict. Of course, one of the most famous uh, reformers of, of military healthcare at the time was Florence Nightingale, um, who helps to reform British Army hospitals and helps to inform the construction of hospitals, uh, not only uh, in Britain, but then around the world as well, including here in the United States after uh, the outbreak of the American Civil War. Now, when we get into the outbreak of the conflict in 1861, the of, of our nation's civil war, uh, there is not a lot of forethought given to emergency medicine. Uh, this is something that is uh, put on the back burner uh, almost immediately. The same with the uh, infrastructure around regular general hospitals. Um, hospitals where sick soldiers or those with longer term uh, injuries uh, may be recuperating. There is very little infrastructure in this country ready to handle uh, all of those uh, those soldiers who are suddenly in need of medical care. The United States Army had one uh, facility, one medical facility for the entirety of the U.S. Army, and it was uh, 40 beds in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, so not exactly the theater of conflict um, during the outbreak of the American Civil War. Great for conflict out on the frontier in the West, uh, but not great for a conflict that is going to be largely centered in the uh, states around the nation's capital and also uh, a little bit further into the Western theater along the Mississippi River as well. So there's going to be a rapid need for large scale infrastructure. And this is going to uh, impact the, the very beginning of the Civil War. You're going to see a lack of this infrastructure. And that means that when you see hospitals being created, they're oftentimes being formed up in uh, pre-existing structures. Uh, here in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., where I'm at today, uh, you see that from almost the immediate outset of the American Civil War, this need for hospital facilities in the nation's capital. And there weren't any. Uh, there was a small hospital uh, for the for the general population of the city of Washington uh, that was quickly filled. And soon you see other government buildings going to be pushed into service as emergency hospitals. Think the United States Capitol building, United States Patent Office, other federal facilities are going to become emergency hospitals just because of the need uh, and the lack of facilities designed for that purpose. Uh, fairly early on in the war, there is going to be a push to create some of this medical infrastructure to create these hospitals so that you can have those government buildings serve the purpose for which they were constructed instead of serving as makeshift field hospitals, makeshift hospitals, have them go back to the service that they were intended for and to have pre to have structures built for that purpose of being a hospital. Um, when you have the outbreak of major hostilities, you are going to see the establishment of battlefield field hospitals. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, for a little bit here in, in some more depth. Um, first major uh, outbreak of hostilities in this theater of the conflict comes uh, at the Battle of First Bull Run on July 21st, 1861. And you're going to see a pattern that it is going to begin at First Bull Run. It's going to last for a couple of years uh, in regards to the placement uh, of field hospitals. And that is going to be, they're going to take on the pattern from previous conflicts and they're going to place them into uh, pre-existing structures that are on the battlefield. And that means homes, barns, outbuildings. Uh, much of the war is going to be fought in rural areas uh, because of the large nature of, of um, because of the nature of these battles, need lots of space in which to fight them. And so oftentimes that means they're going to be in rural areas. That's not always the case. Uh, see Battle of Fredericksburg is a great example of this, where other buildings, uh, basically an entire city will become a field hospital. Um, but right there at first bull run, you see these field hospitals are going to be established in pre-existing homes, barns, outbuildings, churches, buildings that are on the battlefield or in the vicinity that are going to be transitioned into field hospitals. Um, and that is going to create some of the more poignant scenes um, in these battles and then at the Battle of First Bull Run as well. Uh, one of the more famous Confederate hospitals is now open as a museum today. You can't go to it, of course, because of COVID-19. Uh, but a shout out to the incredible folks at Ben Lomond, um, which is a Confederate field hospital during the Battle of First Bull Run. And that's a great place where you can go and visit and you can experience what one of those hospitals would have been like, a battlefield uh, hospital at first bull run. You can see the chaos 
of, of that hospital. Uh, and that is something that is common in most of the hospitals in the early stages of the war. They were organized mostly at a regimental level, which means that that lower level um, of, of organization, they're not at the brigade or the division size, which means that there are relatively few personnel on hand, relatively few supplies, um, especially if your hospital is unfortunate enough to be located closest to the battlefield. It often means you're going to be inundated with patients. It overwhelms the supplies, overwhelms the personnel on hand. And this is going to be something that is going to be seen at first full run, but it's going to be seen at subsequent battles as well. There is going to be a major problem um, throughout the, con the early stages of the war of these hospitals becoming overwhelmed by the number of patients, especially as the battles escalate in size. Um, as the war progresses, you're going to see a major changeover in kind of where these hospitals are going to be located, how they're going to be formed up. Uh, Right at the first Battle of Bull Run through 1861, 1862, uh, even into the end of 1862, uh, these hospitals are going to be located in uh, those pre-existing structures. By the time you start to get to 1863, you do see a change in the location of where these hospitals are going to be located on the battlefield. Uh, many times they'll be attached to uh, pre-existing structures on the battlefield, but what you see is a change over to performing operations um, and surgical operations are going to come outside of the buildings and into uh, empty areas adjacent to those structures where they're going to construct uh, hospital tents. And so many of the surgeries that are going to go on from 1863 through the end of the war, many of the surgical operations at field hospitals during the Civil War are going to be conducted outside. Uh, and this goes back to Florence Nightingale in the 1850s during the Crimean War and the idea about the importance of fresh air uh, in these hospitals, the importance of fresh air uh, leading to uh, more cleanliness, uh, leading to uh, better outcomes for patients. And so these hospitals are instead of going to be taken out of the homes, out of the barns, uh, and are going to be put into these tent field hospitals that are constructed. And that allows for this airflow, which Civil War medical professionals believe is going to be more helpful for those patients to ultimately recover from their wounds. Uh, it does have a benefit, as we would look back on it today, to say it's probably better to operate out in the open air than it is to be operating in a dank, dark, smelly barn um, that had animals uh, in it, um, or previously had animals in it. Um, many vectors for uh, the rampant infections that are going to spread during the Civil War uh, in some of those structures that they're going to be putting uh, into the um, I'm going to be putting into those hospitals. Um, so that's a, a you know kind of a quick overview of of where these hospitals are located. Uh, important to note that throughout the Civil War, Civil War field hospitals are chaotic disorganized places. Um, these are places, uh, makeshift hospitals that are going to be dealing with tens of thousands of casualties during one of these major Civil War battles. Uh, these are places you would not want to be, but nevertheless, they were places of mercy. They were places where medical care was given um, that was uh, up to the standards of emergency medical care anywhere in the world at that time. It wasn't always that way. In the early stages of the war, those doctors operating in Civil War field hospitals uh, were oftentimes, uh, they were experiencing battle and the chaos of war and some of the wounds that they were seeing for the first time. Uh, in excess of 90% of surgeons that served during the American Civil War had never seen a gunshot wound before they went into the service. So they're going to be introduced to this, uh, to emergency medicine, battlefield medicine, while they're experiencing it in during one of these battles. And so that is going to lead to not always the best outcomes, again, especially during the early stages of the conflict. There was very little screening for surgeons during the beginning of the war. And so there's a lot of inexperience and a lot of ineptitude among surgeons in the early stages of the conflict. As the war goes on, though, that changes and there's going to be reforms that are going to be put through in the U.S. Army and the Confederate Army that are going to see some of those inadequate surgeons pushed out or pushed into roles where they are not having their hands on patients and, and working with the surgeon with the surgeries um, and doing things like amputation. So you do see as the war goes on increasing professionalization in these hospitals. But Nevertheless, even though these are professional doctors, by the time you get to the large scale battles in 1863 and 1864, these battles of massive uh, proportions that were unthinkable uh, by 1861 standards, uh, even the professional doctors are overwhelmed by what they're seeing at places like the Wilderness and Spotsylvania Courthouse uh, and Chickamauga and Gettysburg. These battles 
tax even those most professional of surgeons. And so because of those large scale battles uh, and these increasingly professional military surgeons, you do see the establishment of some fundamentals of emergency medicine in these field hospitals that are still with us today. Thinking things like triage uh, is going to be something that is going to be required in these hospitals just because they need to prioritize who is going to get medical treatment first in these dangerous situations. Um, in these in these life or death situations um, that are going to see you know the most important the most deadly injuries going to be dealt with first so let's talk about triage in the civil war for just a quick second so unlike triage today which we are unfortunately seeing um, coming into play in some of the covid 19 hospitals those that are experiencing uh large-scale outbreaks of, of that disease uh unlike what we see today with triage where we're treating those who have some of the most severe uh most severe cases uh most severe injuries in a in a mass casualty type situation um thinking injuries to the head to the chest um, in, in the case of, uh, you know, where you have physical injuries or in the case of, of with disease, uh, where you have those who are in most dire need of, of a ventilator. Um, unlike our situation today in the 1860s, many of those patients, doctors really couldn't do much about. Think things, injuries to the head, to the chest. Uh, to the abdomen, there's very little that a Civil War surgeon can do, especially when they are under a time crunch and you have 60, 70, or 80 patients waiting outside to get into your hospital that are also in dire need of care, decisions needed to be made. And so one of those decisions that is going to be made early as they're bringing these patients into the hospitals are who can I treat and who can I treat quickly um, that will be most beneficial to save their life? And that is going to be those with injuries to arms and legs, shattered bones. These are amputation cases that they can uh, fairly quickly remove a limb, uh, talking 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so good surgeon can can safely remove uh, an arm or a leg and, and prepare that patient for rehabilitation after um, after the conflict is over and once they're back to a general hospital. Those are by and large the patients that are gonna see treatment first. Um, then those with, with the walking wounds, those that they can patch up, uh, make sure they don't become one of the more severe cases. Um, in some cases, get them back out to the front lines to their units. And then finally, the last uh, patients that are treated are those with mortal injuries, those with those injuries that the doctors feel that they can't really do anything about. And they're going to, at first, very important, um, even before they set them aside, they're going to make them comfortable. Opium, uh, painkillers in all forms are used in uh, vast quantities during the Civil War. Um, and so they're making those mortal, so-called mortal patients comfortable until they can ultimately bring them back to the table once the crunch of battle is over and those vast quantities of wounded coming in um, are, are going to be treated and cared for. Then you start to see the treatment for injuries if those patients are still alive, injuries to the head, to the chest, to the abdomen. Um, they're going to try to do what they can with their limited medical knowledge. Um, so as the war goes on in these these situations, uh, you know, these battlefield situations are continuing to worsen. You do see other reforms that are going to come in. Uh, we've talked about them ad nauseum, uh, both in these presentations uh, and, and at the museum as well and in programs that we've done. They talk about people like Jonathan Letterman, who are going to establish uh, ambulance corps and train stretcher bearers that are going to prioritize getting patients to field hospitals very quickly um, because as we refer to uh, as, as medical professionals today would refer to golden hour, uh, making sure that you're getting uh, care to patients as fast as possible. And that's going to lead to better outcomes. They had the same idea during the Civil War. And that same idea is that the faster you treat the patient, the better the outcome is going to be for them. Um, the sooner you perform something like an amputation, the better the chance the patient has of ultimately surviving that injury, surviving that wound. Um, so you do see those reforms come into place during the war um, that are going to really shape uh, you know, emergency medicine right up to the present day. And the field hospitals are where those, uh, some of those reforms are going to take place. Other uh, changes that are going to be made. Early war, regimental hospitals, by and large. Uh, by the time you get to 1862, you're going to see the rise of division-sized hospitals. That means you're uh, putting our hospital in a centralized location that's easy to access the main battlefield, the, the places where the wounds are actually being generated. Um, and it means you're amassing your supplies. It means you're amassing your personnel all in that same place and you have your trained stretcher bearers and ambulance drivers they know where those hospitals are located so they know where to take them and that is going to lead to those faster uh 
faster numbers in terms of getting patients to the hospital. Um, you look at comparison between the battle of First Bull Run, where Union Army leaves wounded soldiers out on the field for days. There's no organized ambulances whatsoever. And you compare it to what happened at Antietam, uh, where both armies are still on the field, which helps um, at the end of the of the end of the fighting. Um, but you see that um, most Union wounded are brought off the field within 24 hours, um, 10,000 of them brought off within 24 hours. It had never been done before to that scale uh, and, and with that much success. And that's Letterman's plan in action uh, right there. So those kind of reforms that you see during the, during the war are going to make these field hospitals, of course, not a pleasant place, but they're going to make them safer places. They're going to make them places that ultimately are going to see better outcomes for patients. Um, now, what's going on in those hospitals? And then this gets to some of the biggest myths associated with the Civil War and with Civil War medicine, um, especially on the battlefield. Uh, most importantly, Civil War surgeons had access to anesthesia, Union and Confederate. Uh, Confederate Army, despite their shortages of many things during the war, uh, understand the importance of anesthetics and making their own anesthetics. And you see the rise of labs across the, the South during the Civil War that are able to manufacture the anesthetics that are needed at the field hospitals. And so you see those surgeons going to be well supplied in the Confederate Army until the very end of the conflict in, in the spring of 1865 um, are going to be supplied with, with anesthetics that they need. Anesthesia is incredibly important to uh, both battlefield medicine during the 1860s, but also uh, in, in medicine on the civilian side. Um, the efficacy and value of, of anesthesia had been proven in the 1840s. And so by the 1860s, um, surgeons are operating with anesthesia. And during the war, it's estimated that 95% of surgeries done during the conflict were done under some form of anesthesia. Um, this is not biting the bullet. This is not biting down on a leather strap. This is not cutting off an arm or a leg in a minute or two. This is a uh, precise for the 1860s, precise surgery that very much in some cases resembles what we do today. Um, because of the advent of anesthesia, patients um, are not awake, not fully awake at least, uh, during these surgeries that they're experiencing in these battlefield hospitals. And because they're not awake and the crunch of time is, is not pushing down on the surgeons, the surgeons themselves have more time. And that having uh, more time with the patient on the table means that they can be more careful, more precise. And instead of just hacking off arms and legs as common um, as Hollywood would have you believe, uh, this is surgery at its, um, you know, it's primitive in terms of they're not washing their hands. Germ theory hadn't been discovered, um, hadn't really been borne out and proved yet. Um, Joseph Lister's, uh, you know, techniques about cleaning everything with, with diluted acid hadn't come around, won't come until 1865. And so it's primitive. Surgery is primitive in that they're not washing anything and, and infection is virtually universal, but the techniques they're using have basis and are still continued to use in some forms today. The tools that they're using all have modern components as well. This is, again, not hacking off arms and legs. This is careful, precise, um, uh, operations and surgeries that are going to see uh, arms and legs removed, about 60,000 amputations performed during the war um, that are going to be done carefully. Um, they're going to be done fast, um, but they're going to be done with the help of anesthesia. And that allows, again, for better outcomes. And then those patients will uh, experience those painkillers that are used in, in vast quantities again during the war. Um, as the conflict goes on, you see these surgeons who are operating in these field hospitals uh, become increasingly good at operating. Um, be they become some of the best surgeons in the world just because they've had so much experience on the hor horrific battlefields of the Civil War. Another reform that I want to just touch on quickly about kind of emergency field hospitals um, is relevant for what we're experiencing today. Uh, and this goes to the longer term care after a major battle. And you see this come under the form of uh, Jonathan Letterman uh, puts in some reforms. You also see similar uh, efforts on the Confederate side as well of the use of um, temporary hospitals um, and hospitals that they can surge, um, you know, increase a hospital's bed numbers by adding tents. Um, to pre-existing hospital facilities to uh, intake uh, additional patients from, say, a major battle or an outbreak of disease. Um, 
But one I want to talk about that directly relates to battlefield medicine is Letterman's uh, plan that he puts into place after Antietam, the establishment of what becomes known as Smoketown Hospital in the vicinity of the Antietam battlefield, where there is an establishment of a long-term emergency hospital uh, in tents, very close to the battlefield that is going to see medical care given to the most severely wounded, the most ill patients that can't be moved back to general hospitals, uh, and it's going to be operated for months upon months in the wake of the battle. So these patients are not just being removed from the battlefield vicinity quickly and taken off to uh, hospitals. Many are, but there are numbers that are not stable enough to be moved. And so they're going to stay on the battlefield. And this is an advent, um, something new that hadn't been seen in American battlefield medicine to this point. Letterman puts it in place after Antietam. Most famously, he is going to improve upon that system. Uh, and his uh, those serving um, with uh, the Union Army in the aftermath of Gettysburg, as well as civilian volunteers um, and other medical professionals, are going to establish Camp Letterman at Gettysburg, which is going to be that same fundamental that you're going to treat patients on the battlefield close to where they're where they were wounded, where they became ill. Um, and, and you're going to treat them there until either they're stable enough to be moved or in, in some cases where they're going to uh, pass away from their injuries or from from their illness. So this is a, something that sticks with us um, right to the present day when we're seeing this advent of hospitals adding on additional uh, facilities. Um, you know, whether they be uh, in tents outside in the parking lot or in the park nearby, um, you're seeing this idea that it was used by Union and Confederate forces during the war at these field hospitals or at general hospitals that need additional surge um, space. They need more beds available because they have too many patients and not enough space. This is something that goes back to the Civil War. This is something that we've experienced before. Um, this is something where we can derive some hope from history that we have adapted to these kinds of situations before. And we have a lot more knowledge now. Uh, about what outcomes can be best. We've had a century and a half of experience in situations with conflicts and disease outbreaks that we are relying on. So the lessons of the Civil War prove out to be, prove the basic fundamentals of, of a lot of different facets of emergency medicine, including how you best organize a field hospital, where you put those field hospitals, and how you staff them and how you organize them, and how you get the patients from the battlefield, from the place of injury or the place of sickness to those hospital facilities. All right, so I do want to uh, that that kind of briefly sums up what I what I wanted to get through about kind of the uh, evolution of hospitals during the war, um, and I want to open up now for for any questions that anybody might have. Um, take a look over here just to see who we've got online with us. All right, so. All right, so Michael says afternoon, Jake. Hi, Michael. Jackie, lunchtime with Jake. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Jackie, for watching. Uh, Ryan Kaiser, thanks for these videos. Had been thinking of becoming a member. It will be hard to visit living in Colorado, but have joined. Um, your content is more than worth the membership fee. Thank you so much. Uh, Ryan, that means a lot. And I know you've been watching a lot of these videos and commenting. Thank you so much for that. It means a lot to us. Thank you so much for becoming a member. Uh, you're helping to sustain our efforts in this difficult time. Again, we don't have admissions coming into the museum. So it makes it, makes it hard to operate. It makes us hard to, makes it hard for us to continue to do this. But we found that this is vitally important that we continue to address these issues and talk about the historical context for many of the same things, um, that we are experiencing today. That Civil War, uh, those living through the Civil War would have experienced. Um, Chad, what was the role of the hospital steward in a field hospital and how many stewards would have been there per hospital? This is a great question. Um, and it really differs from hospital to hospital um, and, and it really is based on the situation. But generally what you're going to see those hospital stewards doing, and, and there's typically uh, one of them per regiment. Um, These regiments are going to have a um, a surgeon and then an assistant surgeon or two and then that non-commissioned hospital steward that's going to fulfill a lot of the uh, roles and responsibilities of you know keeping data uh, keeping statistics keeping the papers organized requisitioning things um, doing a lot of the uh, we call them the workhorse of civil war medicine they're they're the unsung heroes they do a lot of the paperwork um, but in an emergency hospital situation they're going to be right there alongside the uh, alongside the surgeons in some cases helping to monitor breathing um, they're going to be there um, trying to keep some semblance of organization in the hospitals. Um, but you also see them out on the battlefield. And that's something that we haven't really talked about because we're talking about the hospitals. Uh, but the aid stations, the field dressing stations on the battlefield oftentimes have a 
hospital steward there um, alongside oftentimes a, an assistant surgeon to provide first aid. This is stopping the bleeding, um, ensuring that those patients are going to be stable enough for transport back to the field hospital. Um, we do have a great primary source on our website, and I'm always on the hunt for more primary sources. Um, so if you do know of, of a great source of, of information, a primary source, um, a letter, a diary, um, a memoir, uh, hospital stewards. Um, I'm always on the hunt for those, um, especially those up on the front lines. Um, but there's one on our website, civilwarmed.org, um, that I'll drop into the comments after this video is over, um, which is a hospital steward looking back on his experience during the Battle of Gaines Mill in June of 1862, which was his first battle. And he goes through his responsibilities as a hospital steward. Um, he calls himself a, a um, combatant, non-combatant. He went onto the battlefield unarmed, um, armed only with his, uh, with his small medical kit alongside an assistant surgeon trying to patch these guys up. Um, and, and it provides a, a good window into what it was like to be a hospital steward um, during one of these battles. Again, that, that story um, comes from a field dressing station, not a field hospital, um, but the ro roles and responsibilities are, are kind of similar um, between those two facilities in the, uh, in the emergency hospital system that is going to be established during the Civil War. Those stewards are going to be very important in keeping things organized, um, making sure that uh, the supplies are there when they're needed, um, and in some cases, especially during dire situations where you have huge influxes of patients helping um, those surgeons um, at the operating table. All right, so um, keep going down here. Look, Taylor Brook, uh, love this. I work for a nonprofit historical association. Love the content so far. Thank you so much for watching, Taylor. Um, Lindsay, how many soldiers died from their wounds after the Civil War was over? Um, that's a really good question, and one that's kind of hard to uh, kind of hard to answer. Um, Many of the soldiers right there at the front lines in these battlefield hospitals, um, we have some decent numbers for them um, about you know what the survival rate was. Um, generally, um, when it comes to, let's say, amputation, um, if wounds were tended to and an amputation or an operation was performed within about um, then about 24 to 48 hours after the original injury, you had upwards of about 70% likelihood of, of surviving those wounds. And that's despite the fact um, that they're, again, not washing their hands um, and, and infection is an ever-present threat. Um, but it also depends on where you were wounded, um, whether or not you're going to survive your your time in those hospitals. Um, if you're wounded in the in the head, the chest, the abdomen, your your likelihood of surviving um, is really up to your your own body's ability um, to to kind of fend off infection, um, to deal with the the subsequent consequences of those wounds. Depends on the wound itself, um, whether or not um, you know the the kind of damage that was done internally when those bullets and shells went rocking through the body. Um, but when it comes to to and to amputations, the closer to the core of the body, the more dangerous. And so you see uh, amputations performed at the shoulder or at the hip um, are far more dangerous than if you have fingers or, or toes amputated. Um, but as for after the war, it's kind of hard to 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 say how many of the soldiers subsequently die of of their of their wounds um, or die of complications related to their wounds. Um, that number, um, uh, you know, is, is one that I'm not familiar with. It may exist out there, um, but I would wager that you know soldiers subsequently suffering. Um, from their injuries um, are going to be dying for, for years um, of, of injuries and wounds and diseases that were suffered during the Civil War. Um, and some of that's borne out by a lot of the pension records. So the pension records for the federal government, which are stored um, and, and can be accessed here in Washington, D.C. at the National Archives, bear out some of the long-term suffering of many of these soldiers, that their experience in a Civil War field hospital is only just the very beginning of the agony of dealing with some of the wounds that they are experiencing during the Civil War. All right. Why is there not more on Confederate field hospitals outside of Cunningham's Doctors in Gray um, and another book, Confederate Hospitals on the Move? There does not seem to be much scholarship on the subject. Um, know that there are federal sources that are better. Um, and keep on reading down through here. I was able to put together a chapter on a brigade level medical care in my book. Um, and my current project on food in the Army of Northern Virginia has a chapter on food and hospitals, but is no one else researching the topic of Confederate medical care? Uh, this is a good question. You know, um, you're, you're right about a lot of the sources not being there, not um, 
kind of official sources. So one of the benefits um, of looking at the, at the federal side, at the, the U.S. Army during the Civil War, is they keep the, these, all of these records. Record keeping becomes a very big focus for the Union Army during the war um, because of the establishment of the Army Medical Museum in 1862. Because of the establishment of the Army Medical Museum, it's a one uh, spot where they're compiling a lot of data, compiling a lot of information, um, bringing it in from the surgeons out in the field and uh, collating that data and then ultimately reshaping um, the, the care uh, for those uh, soldiers, for those wounded soldiers in those hospitals. So you see this um, collection of that data and then afterwards the publishing of the um, of the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion gives us a lot of the statistics. Um, from a kind of the, the, the meta scale, the, from the big scale, um, from the macro, um, looking at, um, at Confederate field hospitals um, is more difficult because there's that lack of those official sources. A lot of those sources were lost or um, are scattered around. They're not centralized in, in one location. It makes it more difficult. Um, but I won't say that there's not an interest um, in it. Uh, I do think that emergency medicine in the, in the Confederacy is fascinating and the evolutions that they make alongside Jonathan Letterman, alongside the, their, their union counterparts um, because of the adaptations they were forced to make. Um, because of those adaptations, it makes it it makes it more difficult. Um, it makes it more difficult to for them to kind of um, you know pull together these these sources like the the, the northern government did um, after the war, uh, the federal government. Um, but you know, there's I think there's a lot of room still out there for more scholarship on that topic, um, and there there are those working in that field trying to um, you know write more about what the Confederate experience was in terms of medical care, and that is just as instructive as the Northern side as well, especially when dealing with the the shortages um, and dealing with other challenges that the Confederate government faced during the war. It is it is a fascinating topic and one that needs to continue to be studied. Um, continue on down here. Very informative. Thanks for watching, Vicki. Um, John from New Jersey. Great to be here. Thanks for watching, John. Um, Trevor. Uh, nice job, Jake. Um, that's from, from Trevor Steinbach. Does a, does a great job with some Civil War medical living history. Um, here's another. A rumor was they disposed of limbs by dropping out of the windows of some of the farmhouses or barns. Any truth to this at all? Yes, Chris, uh, this is true. Um, and this is what makes some of these hospitals some of the most gruesome places to be on a Civil War battlefield. Um, forget about the front lines and the carnage you see there. These ho hospitals are charnel houses. They're places that you did not want to be, and those who experienced those hospitals were left with a very vivid memory of what they saw in those hospitals. Blood everywhere, um, the moans and screams of those who are wounded, um, who have not yet undergone care, um, um, the groans of those who have undergone care uh, and are waking up from their uh, from their chloroform or ether induced stupor um, coming out of surgery, uh, and then you get to the amputated arms and legs. Again, the, the amputation is the most common surgery performed during the war, uh, and as a result, these field hospitals uh, are, are scenes of arms and legs being thrown out windows. Um, story from Fredericksburg, Virginia. The, Chatham House, which is um, the, the headquarters of the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park, um, was a hospital. Uh, there were uh, allegedly uh, limbs stacked up almost to the second floor between a tree outside. Um, this is something that was pretty common uh, during the war, and you hear that from multiple uh, major battlefields of, wound, of amputated limbs being stacked up. Um, there are some photographs of this as well. There's one um, in the National Archives called Field Day, taken at one of these hospitals where it's just a, a pile of amputated arms and legs. And that's something that they were not dealt, they were not dealing with those limbs with a, with a lot of reverence. Um, they were medical waste that was to be disposed of as fast as possible. And that oftentimes ended up meaning that they're gonna be thrown into pits, they're gonna be burned, um, and they're gonna be disposed of and gotten away from the hospital as fast as possible. And it led to some scenes of, uh, rather unpleasant scenes in, in many of those hospitals. But yes, that is a true story of those being tossed out windows, um, being left outside the hospital, um, definitely marks of, of, you know, you don't wanna go to those hospitals. They're, they're known for being places where, you know, the wreckage of the battlefield is gonna be dealt with. And it's not a, it's not a pretty sight at all. Oh, keep going on here. Uh, Connie says, thanks so much, Jake. I learn something new every time I watch one of these programs. Thank you so much for, for watching, Connie. Appreciate you, uh, you tuning in. Um, Vicki Stevens, putting together a Civil War nursing impression and I'm eager to learn everything I can to make a persona as historically accurate as possible. Loving all these videos and all your information. Uh, thank you so much, Vicki. Uh, uh, you know, 
We're always uh, working with living historians, so we'd love to know more about your your nursing work, your nursing impression um, that you're you're working on. Um, we do have res resources on our website, um, both for living historians uh, as well as for uh, students and teachers. Uh, if you go onto our website, civilwarmed.org, um, there is a section of the website. It's right up on the homepage. Um, it's about uh, remote learning resources, uh, and you can find all of our blog posts. You can find uh, primary sources. You can find access to uh, our video archives um, as well as uh, databases that we keep all that information is at your fingertips and that's what we want you to use it for um, to shape uh, your your uh, historical interpretation um, and to, to shape the education of future generations as well uh, we want to make access to this as easy as possible so uh, thanks for watching and I, I hope you'll uh, you'll check out the website as well um, Continuing down our comments here from Wendy. Is it true that there would only be three to five surgeons performing surgery at each field hospital? This has some measure of truth to it um, because um, as the war goes on, those surgeons who show a real aptitude for surgery are going to be the ones who are going to be called upon time and time again to perform these surgeries. Um, there's going to be decisions made uh, within army leadership, army medical leadership specifically, again, within both armies. There's going to be decisions made about who are going Going to be the ones performing certain kinds of amputations, certain kind of operations, who is going to show that they have the expertise that is needed to provide safe, uh, safe, you know, as safe as they could be in the 1860s medical operations. Um, and so there are going to be those who are going to be selected for certain kinds of injuries, certain kind of wounds. They might have specialization. Um, and we do see specialization come in during the war. There are going to be some doctors, some surgeons who are going to specialize in some areas uh, and avoid other areas. And so you do see that go on during the war, that there will be decisions made as to who will be performing the operations. And you can see that borne out in some of the primary sources. And you read some of the doctor's accounts, um, some of those that prove to be more skilled surgeons are going to be the ones that are going to be operating in a major battle uh, 60, 70, 80 times in a, in a single day or over the course of a single battle. Um, and so that would be sometimes be the case. You would see surgeons uh, posted specifically to surgical detail um, and other uh, surgeons, other other doctors, uh, military doctors who may be in the hospital may find themselves having other roles in those hospitals um, just because they want to have their best skilled hands um, at the tables at all times. Uh, great question there. Um, there's a picture of, of um, this is from Tony, a picture of severed limbs outside of a hospital. Yep, that's that field day um, photograph. We have it in the collection of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Um, it is from the National Archives. Um, it's, it's not a pretty image by any means, but it does show the reality um, of what uh, Civil War um, surgeons and Civil War soldiers were facing during the war. Um, all right, Patricia from Biglerville, PA. Thanks for all the information you provide. Thanks for watching, Patricia. I've, I've seen you on multiple of our uh, uh, videos um, and commenting, so thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, from Damien, uh, from across the pond. Great stuff, Jake. Thanks for doing this. Uh, enjoying watching from Lockdown, Ireland. Um, if you don't, uh, if you aren't familiar with Damien's um, incredible Irish and the American Civil War project, highly recommend you check it out. Um, he does some amazing work and has some um, has a blog post that's on our Clara Barton Museum website. So if you go to clarabartonmuseum.org, uh, he has an article about the 1893 pension crisis um, that you can read about there about pensioners abroad um, of immigrants. Um, so that's a really cool article. Um, and Damien has an amazing project. You should definitely check it out. Um, Chris, some guy off Route 28 had a haunted tour. He claims on his property was one of those uh, field hospitals. Um, this is something that is something we see commonly, uh, you know, that places that may not have a connection to Civil War medicine claiming to be a hospital because there's some romance or some horror specifically associated with it. Um, you see the sim similarities with places that claim to be um, spots on the Underground Railroad or places where Washington might have slept. Um, this is something that, uh, this is an area of fascination for people. Um, hospitals, uh, field hospitals, the, the gory details of all of this seem to trigger something in, in our imaginations. And people want to, um, in some cases, uh, profit off of that. And that's not always great. I mean, it doesn't always have a basis in fact, um, but that's a big focus of what the National Museum of Civil War Medicine does. We are all about finding accurate information and proving or disproving whether or not a place was actually a hospital. Uh, from Nancy, fascinating. I've been taking notes for my future presentations. Excellent. Na excellent. Nancy, thanks for tuning in. Uh, another from, keep going down. So we've gotten through all of our questions that I have for now. 
Um, let me just make sure of that. All right. Well, thank you all so much uh, for, for tuning in. Again, sorry uh, for our technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, this is all still pretty new to us, and we're still you know, learning all of the tools, learning all of the techniques that are involved with streaming. So thanks for bearing, uh, sticking with us. Appreciate that. Um, if you do enjoy our streams, um, our, our videos, uh, please uh, consider uh, donating to the museum. Even small amounts will help us. Um, those small amounts um, can, can help to sustain us. Again, we don't have admissions coming in. Consider becoming a member as well. Um, like Ryan uh, mentioned in the comments earlier, becoming a member because of these videos. It helps us, it helps sustain these efforts, allows us to continue doing these videos and keep our doors open. I uh, really do appreciate all of you who have donated already. And for those of you who may not have, um, you know, consider doing it moving forward, even if you don't have the, the financial ability to do it right now. Um, consider coming to the museum once uh, we are out of lockdown. Um, consider coming and visiting. Um, that's the main focus of, of why we do these videos. We want to encourage you all to, to know about the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, know about what we do. And thank you all so much for, for coming on and, and hanging out with us um, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, with some special features going to be thrown in in the next couple of weeks, some special interviews as well. Um, we want to uh, to reach out, and it's nice to to have human contact with other people, uh, even if it is through Facebook. Um, the the uh, amazing uh, joys of modern technology allow us to to stream and comment and interact with each other. And and thank you all so much for watching. Um, know that uh, we do have these videos do go up on YouTube afterwards. So if you have friends or family who may not be on Facebook, um, you can direct them over to our YouTube channel um, and they can find all of these videos there. All right. Well, this is Jake Wynn from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum signing off. I hope you all have a wonderful day and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Stay healthy out there, folks.